So welcome everybody. This is the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform uh, community call. This is the Tuesday, every single Tuesday, 8 a.m. Pacific time call where we have Microsoft presenters showing you the art of art of possible within Microsoft 365 and Power Platform. Today is September 19th. My name is Sersa Juvonen. I'm a principal product manager in the Microsoft 365 platform areas. Now, today uh, we'll start with a typical setup of uh, recapping all of the different assets which we have available for you to get started and, and how to get involved within the community. We actually want you to get involved and do demos and contribute samples in the open source and all of that. And we'll kind of talk about that one a bit. Um, and uh, then we go to the together mode picture. And then after that, we go to the actual starts of today uh, for within the demo section. We'll start with Dan Walling uh, related on creating an Azure OpenAI resource and deploy a model for your solution. That's actually really cool. That model uh, refers to uh, learning models and AI learning models, which is really, really cool stuff uh, and top of the top of the technology spurs, uh, whatever, uh, adaption in Microsoft as well. So really, really cool. Christian is going to talk about user profile photos in Microsoft 365 and roadmap updates on that side. And then Marcel is going to do a live demo on creating a power app from your existing API with Visual Studio Code and power for the Power Platform. So really, really cool demos today. Uh, and we'll close up within, uh, within an hour. Now, before we go to the stars of today, uh, let's recap some of the assets which are available. So first of all, you can get the recordings of all of these community calls and individual demos from our Microsoft 365 Power Platform community video channel. Uh, subscribe there today. Uh, it's the easiest way to actually stay up to date on what's happening and stay up to date on all of the good videos which are getting released. Right now, for the upcoming months, actually, we are releasing at least two videos every single day within the channel uh, related on Microsoft 365 and Power Platform uh, topics. So a lot of, lot of new stuff uh, getting released over there. We also have our LinkedIn group for discussions and updates, so you can share your findings and have a discussions with other people in the community. We have a lot of open source assets, but as it might be a bit difficult to get started just from the GitHub or find the relevant sample for you, we also have these sample galleries, which are the easiest way to find the relevant sample for you. There's a lot of URLs to remember, but actually all of these can be found from AKMS forward slash community forward slash home, so you can download the recurrent invites and, and as a, accessing all of the different other assets which are available. So as mentioned, we have quite a lot of these community calls. So we have at least two community calls every single week. This week, as an example, we have three. We have today's call with Microsoft 365 and Power Platform uh, with Microsoft uh, presenters. Tomorrow, we'll have the monthly Power Platform community call, uh, typically with community presenters. And then on Thursday, we have the Viva Connection and SharePoint Framework community call uh, with community uh, presenters as well. So a lot of, lot of different calls happening. All of these are getting recorded, so you don't have to be in all of them. Of course, you can if, it, if, you, if you want to, and you can download all of the invites from AKMS for such community for such calls. If you're wondering on what are the what is on the agenda, you can always go to the AKMS forward slash community forward slash meetup where we publish the agendas for the calls about a week, be, week before the call. So you can easily stay up to date on, on what's coming. Now, I did mention that you are willing to uh, uh, present as well, and there are a lot of calls which have community presenters, and these are great ways to get some experience on presenting. We will even either we will even guide you on the presentation if needed. So, if you're a first-time presenter, we will we can set up you a training sessions with us and help you to do those presentations. So, if you're kind of in between on hey. Am I experienced enough? Should I do that? The answer is yes, you should do that. Uh, share your findings here, share your sample, share your solution, share your uh, scenario or whatever you built, and we can guide you through uh, the presentation and process as well. Just go to the AKMS forward slash community, forward slash request and demo, and we'll get you scheduled. Now, if you're not in ready to do yet that, but you're looking into getting started in Microsoft 365 or in the by Microsoft Power Platform areas, we have a lot of assets for you to get started. So we have our free Microsoft 365 developer platform, uh, developer tenant, which will, which will automatically renew in every single 90 days as long as you use it for development purposes. And there's a lot of, lot of learning material available in the Microsoft Learn. So a lot of, lot of material, which is free for you to take advantage. We also have our uh, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly calls uh, or uh, podcasts and uh, video blogs. Uh, so the BMP Weekly, went, so the latest one on that one, went live today with Kasper Larsen talking about Microsoft 365 typically and covering the latest news across the platform. But there's also the Mondays at Microsoft with uh, Caruana and Heather, Power Platform Connections with David Warner and Hugo Bernier, and then the Microsoft 365 Developer Podcast uh, with Jeremy Thake and Paul Shufflin on Ike or Aisha Bash. All of these are great ways of staying up to date on what's happening. 
Now, I did also mention that we test a lot of samples. There's actually more than 1,700 samples from Microsoft and from the community. And these are great assets for you to take advantage. So if you're looking into implementing something for Microsoft Teams or for SharePoint or for Power Apps or Power Platform in general, there might be a sample available for you to get you inspired or get you unblocked on the potential problem that you keep on having, or maybe get the, an, uh, the right idea for your particular business scenario. So please have a look at AKMS forward slash community forward slash samples. It's a really simple centralized uh, portal for where we are surfacing all of the available samples. Now, as you find a sample, uh, you might be then wondering, on, okay, now I'm in GitHub. How do I, know, how do I, this is, in, I don't know, how do I get started? But luckily, David is here to help you. David, how's LA? Yes, thank you from Finland, uh, Vesa, thank you. Yes, what are these Gibbs and Huts and Hubs and all these things? Well, we are going to help you learn more about them. So the Sharing is Caring program is here to provide hands-on guidance. What does that mean? It means that we are gonna get together in a live Teams call and work through how to do all these amazing things like submit a pull request or perhaps what is a pull request? Use these samples, contribute back to these samples. Those 1,700 samples didn't just happen out of thin air. Uh, we didn't lock Vesa in his basement uh, just for like 1,100 of them, but the rest of them were all from you. So we want to empower you to do even more. These are free, they are safe space, they are not recorded and we welcome anyone and everyone to join. We've got more scheduled for October just after the Power Platform Conference so as you get inspired on these amazing ways in which you can contribute to the community, we're going to help you do it. So definitely go check it out, aka.ms slash sharing is caring, 100% free and a wonderful safe space to collaborate with others in the community. Now, once you have contributed, we want to recognize you. And so our community recognition program is still alive and well and growing. We've got new badges. We've got new thematic, exciting things coming up like the pumpkin spice latte commits. Everybody's getting ready for fall and excited. And of course, what's right around the corner? Hacktoberfest. So we got our badges ready. We got even more coming up soon. So definitely go opt in, get registered, ak.ms slash community slash recognition. Absolutely free, all powered by Credly. So you can show that you're making a difference in the community. Vesa, back to you in Finland. Excellent, thank you, David, on that one. Now, uh, I love, by the way, the batches, batches, batches on the on the chat. The GIF always pops in when we are showing the slide for whatever reason. That's actually really, really good. Always makes me smile. Now um, we got the Natalie bot on it, so she <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank you, Natalie, on that one. Now, there's also a lot of other great events uh, which are happening all around the world, across the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform areas, and showcasing the art of possible. On the 365 Edgecon series and the DC and Seattle already happened. But Chicago is happening on October 13th to November 3rd. So great opportunity again, engaging with the com other people in the community and learn the latest from the uh, from the presenters. Now, before actually that one, there's these are not in the right uh, order. Uh, we have the Microsoft Power Platform Conference happening in MGM at Las Vegas on uh, October 3rd to October 5th. So great option again on, uh, on getting access on the latest from Microsoft and also meeting up with all of the other people in the community. Now on top of this, with this uh, we have from November 14th to 17th, uh, we have the Microsoft Ignite happening in Seattle. Really, really awesome opportunity as well. Um, and this will be partly broadcasted live as well. So there are online dates and then there are in-person Seattle dates. So partly of uh, this is a hybrid setup. So some of the events are or presenters presentations, some of the sessions, I think that's the right way of saying that, are only in uh, in person and some of, the, uh, some of the sessions are online. And then uh, we wanted to actually just uh, call out uh, that you should be marking your calendars uh, in April 13th, May 1st and 2nd in 2024. We have the Microsoft 365 conference coming up in 2024. Um, this is really, really early, um, but we're looking into making this the biggest Microsoft 365 conference there has been. Uh, there's going to be a little great opportunity for catching up on what's the latest Microsoft 365, Copilot, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Viva, SharePoint, and all of that stuff. And we have a lot of people already confirmed to be a speaker from Microsoft side on this conference. We're just setting up uh, internal planning on this earlier this week. So definitely check out and make sure that you have those dates in your calendar. Now, on top of these kind of a bigger conferences, there's a lot of, lot of smaller conferences and, and meetups available across the world. So it doesn't mean that you need to fly to Orlando or Las Vegas to meet the other people in the community, not at all. It might be that within your city, wherever you are within the world, there might be the community events, which might which could be free, or they might have a small cost associated to them. Please use the communitydays.org to catch up on what's the latest uh, within this area. So really, really great option as well. 
Now, on the news site, uh, there wasn't actually that many news happening this week. It's, it is an interestingly quiet uh, week. Uh, maybe we'll have more news coming up within upcoming weeks then. And that's typically what happens. But there was a, a news around all, all about Microsoft Teams the webinars. So there's a new office hour setting up for Microsoft Teams webinars. Really good thing in there. There was some uh, cool uh, industry insights uh, on and, uh, research insights related on uh, industry trends on technology side. There was a simplified license management and auto claim to power apps and licensing inside for power automate updates. There was data suggest um, that there was data which is suggesting that Microsoft 365 certification increases app adoption rates, which is really really cool uh, insights as well. If you look, if you're an ISV and putting a, a stuff available in the Microsoft marketplace, and then there was a SharePoint Framework 1.18 release going live in last week as well. So a lot of other cool news. Now, on top of this, uh, we also wanted to cover uh, the latest in the team's platform updates, and this time it's going to be Mukul covering uh, what's available in here. Hey, thank you so much, Vesa. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Mukul. I'm from Microsoft Teams uh, platform, to be specific. Uh, we look into the platform capabilities uh, using which the app developers, our customers, partners can actually build some awesome apps inside Microsoft Teams. You might be using certain APIs which are used to get control of your camera, get control of the audio, video, etc. Right? There could be some so much different capabilities which you could use on, on Teams. And the platform comes into picture in all those occurrences. Specifically on mobile, there are all these capabilities which we expose using our JS SDK. And that gets controlled or that those capabilities are built by the platform team. So in case you have any such requirements, feel free to get in touch with us. Today, very quickly, I wanted to talk about some awesome things which we are doing around the performance of apps in Teams platform. So performance is one of the big focus areas for us, right? And we continue to investigate. We continue to get in touch with you, get feedback to see what more we can do. But today I want to very quickly highlight the app caching capability which we have developed. So with this, app developers can actually implement app caching. And with this, what will happen is that whenever there are subsequent launches of your apps, they will happen instantly if not instantly very very fast and on the right hand side on the slide you will see a very quick case study which i wanted to showcase to you viva engage is one of the good apps used for engagement for community feed exchange of information and we see that viva engage has implemented app caching and they see a 60 percent benefit in the app loading time in their subsequent launches so feel free to look into the documentation which I have posted on this slide at the bottom to see how app caching can be implemented. And please reach out to us in case you have any feedback or any questions. In addition, there are certain best practices which you can use for improving the uploading time, right? So we highly recommend you to use um, uh, service workers, to use web storage, to improve the app loading performance for your apps inside Microsoft Teams. So that's it. Take a look at app caching, service workers, web storage, and see how you can improve your app loading performance for your apps inside Microsoft Teams. For any feedback, do reach out to us. You ha we have a link on aka.ms slash Teams platform feedback, and those links are also available at the bottom in the footer of this particular slide. So please go on, see how you can improve the app loading performance, and reach out to us for any feedback. Thank you so much, guys. Excellent. Thank you, Mukul, on that one. And then we'll move to the, the most exciting moment of the week. We'll do a crew photo with everybody who are willing to enable the camera. Uh, so we have 50 seats in the room. Um, you can enable the camera. Really, really sharp pixel. No pixelation today. I'm not going to actually enable my camera then. Uh, we are pretty much ready to go on my side, but let's wait. Oop. Let's wait for the 50 seats to get filled in. Uh, we can see Hugo can be the example and Ralph. Yeah, I can see the tip tying already happening there. There we go. Yeah, this is good. Uh, we have still some seats in the room. Uh, oh, there's a familiar faces even more. So people are popping in and going out. Let's wait for a few more seconds. Uh, I saw a few more faces. Oh, there we go. Uh, and there's a, what is that? Is that a tiger? That is, I have no idea what's in the right next to Ralph. But let's put the recording on and let's do some hand waving, everybody. So we'll grab a GIF animation out of this and share it in the social media right after the call. Awesome, awesome to have you joining on the call. Um, excellent, really, really cool. 
and I will grab the GIF animation out of that. Brilliant, awesome. Good to see familiar faces and the excitement. That's really, really cool. Now, related on the excitement, I'm actually super, super excited to see what Dan has queued up uh, for today's demo. He did actually kind of a you know, you teased up something what we're going to do today already last week, right? So we're going to do a quick series, not a quick series, quite a long series about these topics uh, within upcoming weeks. Right, Dan? Yeah. Excited to be back for, I guess we're on week two, folks, officially of this series. So um, we're going to be talking about taking your line of business apps to the next level. And the way we're going to do that is through some AI functionality, uh, adding communication where appropriate, and organizational data. So to give you an idea of today, um, today is all about assisting users with AI, and this is going to be part one of, we have three more of these uh, coming up. So we're going to talk about creating an Azure OpenAI resource. So if you've never done that before, you'll see the process. You'll see it's actually really simple to do. And then later, as we keep moving in the series, we're going to talk about how you can inter interact with the APIs and actually use this uh, in your app in some creative ways. So this is the second one in the series. As uh, Vesa mentioned, we have a, quite a few of these planned. Uh, the next ones are all going to be about Azure OpenAI. Now, I do want to emphasize we're going to focus on Azure OpenAI, but you could also use OpenAI as well. So just as a heads up, the app I'm going to be showing you, it supports both. I'll let you kind of play with that if you want. Uh, once we get through those, we'll get back into communication. This will be phone calling, SMS, uh, email. And then we're going to talk about bringing organizational data into your apps. But today, we're going to jump right into kind of where we are in the app. So I mentioned organizational data. This is part of what you'll be able to do. We're going to learn how we could use Microsoft Graph Toolkit or just Microsoft Graph if you want, and actually bring in calendar events, emails, files, things like that provides a great way to avoid that user context shifting that we all do, where you go down that rabbit hole to find something and then come back out and you never found what you were looking for. Um, we're also gonna talk about good and bad use cases. Um, one that's a little more challenging, you just saw there was uh, natural language to SQL. We'll also get into communication, as I've mentioned, and that includes phone calling, uh, email, SMS, and the email SMS, we're gonna focus on that part today not the sending of it, but how can we actually generate, as you'll see here momentarily, uh, an email and an SMS message using OpenAI. And that's what we're gonna get to right now. So with that, um, you've all probably heard of OpenAI or Azure OpenAI, and let, you know, unless you just got out of your cave like you know yesterday or something, um, they're obviously in the news everywhere because of the popularity of chat GPT and some of the other models or options out there. Um, as I mentioned, you could use OpenAI with this, and I'm gonna briefly just jump to their page. But oh, Azure OpenAI is what I'm gonna focus on and how you can actually get a model up and running there and deployed. And then you can do some really cool stuff right in Azure OpenAI Studio. So if you've never seen that before, I'm gonna walk you through that. All right. So moving along, let's jump right off to a demo, not the Star Wars, okay, close. So first off, everything we're talking about in this series, and I'll have a link for you, a short link at the end of this, is gonna be in this uh, sample tutorial that you have here. I'll give you that at the end. Um, so just to walk you through, you would clone the repo, of course, to get to the code we're gonna be using, but then you get to this step, and that is creating an Azure OpenAI resource and deploying a model. And what this exercise will do is walk you through everything I'm now going to show you in like, you know, 10 minutes. Um, but it's pretty quick to get through, and it has all the steps if you want to do that yourself. Now, I mentioned that you can use OpenAI. So with OpenAI, you can go to platform.openai.com, and then you can click right up here. I'm not going to do it because some personal info will pop down. And you can actually get a key. And that secret key is what you could use to call these models. Okay, now we're gonna do it in Azure though. Same models that you could work with. And the way it would work is you would just come up and type OpenAI. You'll see Azure OpenAI. Now I use it a fair amount, so you'll see it right here. And then once you go to that, you'll go in and create, just like we would normally do in the Azure portal. 
And once the screen decides to come up, there we go. You pick your uh, resource group, your region, your name, and there's only one pricing tier as of today. I do expect that'll probably change because it usually does, but we're still a little bit early days on this. And then you would just go through the next, next finish process. Now, I already have one created because given that I have about 10 minutes or so, I didn't want to uh, test the uh, demo god fate. And so I have this one right here. I was actually testing a little bit earlier just for generating like starting the starting text of blog posts, as an example. Um, and so let me show you what's here. So first off, you're going to see an endpoint. Later, as we go through this series, you're going to see where that comes into play, but you do need an endpoint. And then you also need a key. And so if you've used Azure much, you're probably pretty used to this keys and endpoint. And you can get the key right there. Two keys so that you can rotate them if you need to, but you would just copy that. We're not going to go into the code part of it today. We're going to focus on deployment of the model. Uh, but next week, we will go into that as well. So you'll notice if I come down to model deployments. Now, this is relatively new in the last... I don't know, two months or so. You used to actually deploy the model right here, but you'll notice now it says manage deployments and it's gonna take you to Azure OpenAI Studio. Now I have that open right here. So if I were to click that, it'll just take me, but I wanted to have both tabs open. And you'll notice that I've already deployed a model, but let me do create new deployment here and show you something. So these are the models that are available to me as of today. Now, you'll notice GPT-4 is there. I have not yet got approval for that. And I work, you know, maybe for Microsoft, but uh, there's a reason for that. It's resource. They want to make sure the customers using it get the resources. So I don't have that, but it is something you can apply to get access to if you want uh, GPT-4. Now, I'm going to be using for most of my stuff, honestly, these days, though, GPT-3.5 Turbo is a cheaper model and it's super fast, thus the name, I guess, Turbo. But this is what I would pick. And then you'll notice here, I can auto update to default. And what this will do is right now, the default version of this is 0301. That's kind of like a March 01 uh, here. But notice there's an 0613. Well, if you've ever heard of uh, function calling in models and open AI. And if you haven't, don't worry about it, but it's a way that you can actually uh, get JSON data back. Then you would need to pick the 013, 0613, because it is supported there, but it's not the default. Eventually it probably will move to the default, but it, it's almost like uh, an LTS versus current. You know, if you use uh, the .NET CLI or if you use Node or one of those, it's kind of a similar model they're going with. So normally I just go with auto update to default. That's the safe way. And with what I'm gonna show you, that's what will work. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment here by that. Then you give it a deployment name. I usually just name it what it is. In this case, it'd be like that, right? Now I already have one, so I won't uh, do that, but that's all it takes, right? You pick your model, go do a little research in the docs on those, and then you're good to go. So let me cancel that because you can see I already have one. And then one thing I, want, I do want to call your attention to is right down here, you're going to notice uh, tokens per minute rate limit. There is 120,000 tokens per minute. Now, if you're not familiar with tokens, words get converted into tokens. It's almost like going back in the day when I was a kid, you know, to the, the gaming uh, buildings and you couldn't use maybe quarters in my world you'd have to convert your quarters or dollar, dollars into uh, something a little more like tokens, right? So I wanna call this out because 120,000 sounds like a lot. If you're rolling this out to a lot of customers, it's not a lot. So just be aware of that. That will change over time, but as of today, just wanna make you aware of it. Okay, so now that we have a deployed model, now what? Well, you would normally jump to code, right? And we're gonna get to that in the next couple of weeks. But I wanna show you what you can do right here in Azure OpenAI first, and then we'll go ahead and uh, move into the other. So I'm gonna jump over to chat. And you'll notice on the left here, I have use a system message template. I could pick Shakespeare Writing Assistant. I demoed that previously, actually. 
Uh, everybody's favorite, if you live in the United States, the IRS tax chatbot. Mm, yeah, that one's fun. Marketing writing, Xbox customer agent, you get the idea. So first, let me show you this one. You're an AI assistant that helps people find information. Now, this is what we'd call the system message. You'll see that right up top here. And then you have the user message, if you will. So like uh, summarize the Roman empire, something like this. Okay, so I didn't tell it much here. That was their default. You're an AI system that provides helpful information, but I'm gonna show you in a moment, you can be very specific about what the system should do. Now notice, because I didn't really tell it what to do, it came back and gave me a little summary here of the, the Roman empire, just as an example. Let me clear that chat. Now let me switch to uh, a real life one for me. We're gonna to go to update the system message to you're an Xbox customer support agent whose primary goal is to help users. So I have two boys. I don't get to game much these days, unfortunately, just in my role, I tend to be pretty busy and uh, I, I respawn a lot. So um, how do I not die so much in my games? I don't know, let's see what it says here. Okay, so she gave us a couple tips, uh, practice. <laughs> <laughs> Tip number one, folks, practice. Yeah, wouldn't have thought of that. Um, or tip number two for me would be learn to be better at this instead of the good old Atari joystick. Yeah, I'm dating myself there. But, uh, you know, use cover, learn the maps, um, all the things my boys are like really, really good at. They don't even let me play anymore, by the way, because it's like, Dad, you, you respawn too much. And I'm like, fine, that, that's fair. So that's an example of one of these models deployed. Now I wanna show you one more thing though that you can do, actually two more things. And that is, that's nice. And, and look at this right here. I could actually deploy what I just selected as an actual app. And they'll even have a way you can secure that app because you don't want anybody getting to the model. It eats up tokens. So you can actually deploy this if you'd like right here, kind of a one-click deployment. There's a little more you'd have to do if you select that. I won't have time to go through it, but that's pretty cool. So like, that's all you'd have to do to get an app that's custom up and running and have your own custom chat bot if you want. Now, what we're gonna be doing though in the app itself is what we'd call GPT completions. And that is the user types, you know, order is delayed two days. And then we've programmed it in the system message to say, hey, return an email message around the rules that the user wants to follow. So orders delayed, give them a 5% discount or something like that. And then it can generate a, a nice email as a starting point. And then of course you can even give it examples of kind of what you want the email to be about. Now notice over here to the right, I have max length tokens, but I have this uh, temperature. This is, one is really, really creative. If you do a completion, odds are you're gonna get different results every single time and they're gonna vary quite a bit. It's how creative do you wanna be? So if I slide this all the way to zero over here, that's like very little creativity, just do the same thing over and over and over. It's almost just like a, a puncher that punches the same you know, hole in the paper every single time. So in this case, you know, we could do whatever, it doesn't really matter. They had it, I had it slid up earlier to one. I'll normally go somewhere in here if it's uh, like an email scenario where I wanna be a little creative. But then notice here, I can come in and they give us a bunch of examples we could actually use such as generate an email. Now this one is you wanna write a product launch email for some new AI powered headphones. They're priced at $79 and they're available at Best Buy, Target and Amazon. All right, what should the subject line be and what should the body be? So if I hit generate, what this will do now is send these tokens up to the model. I'm now streaming back tokens, which gets converted to words. And it gave me an example of what I could actually do. And if we let it go here, it'll actually have a little more details and then you know, here's a subject line. You won't believe what we just released, new AI powered headphones. Okay, nothing too phenomenal, but you know, still pretty cool. Now, if I wanted to start using this in a couple different languages, I can hit view code. This is Python. You'll see right up here, this drop down. But notice that they actually give me an example of how to get started using this. 
which is pretty cool. And this is what we're going to start going through in the next sessions. Uh, or I can switch, switch over to C-sharp if I want to do that. Now, I'm actually going to show you one that's going to be in TypeScript because it's pretty neutral. But uh, just be aware that that's kind of what the code would look like. And we'll start talking about that as we move along here. Notice there's my endpoint and there's my key that I talked about a little bit earlier. All right, so pretty fun. Now to wrap up, um, I'm not gonna go into this in the sessions, but hey, we're here, so let's just go there. Um, Dolly, all right, you've all probably heard of Dolly or Midjourney maybe. Um, they are ways to actually generate images from text. So I could say, you know, create a castle on a hill um, in a beautiful river valley. I don't know, I'm just making this up. Now, I didn't test this exact one, so you, you never know. So if I hide it real quick, you'll know it didn't turn out like I wanted, but normally it's it's pretty good at it. So, all right, there we go. So it generated a castle on a hill, um, and then you can play with it from there. Now, we're not gonna go into that one, but that's another feature that is available with these models. They even give you some examples, like a mountain goat drinking at an alpine lake, digital art, and there's some of the things it would generate. So with that, let me go on back here. All of this again is in this tutorial. You'll see a code there you can scan or I'll give you a link on the next slide here. But if you wanna start going through this, we'll walk you through step-by-step. Step. And uh, next week, we're gonna start diving into, okay, that's great, we deployed a model. Now, how do we actually use it in our code? And that's what we're going to look at. So I'll see you next week. Uh, feel free to check out the link here or scan it. And uh, that'll get you the tutorial. So Vesa, back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. On that one, really, really cool stuff. And looking forward to next steps within the series. So awesome, awesome, awesome intros. Now, next we'll move into the Kristen's uh, presentation around the user profile photos in Microsoft 365 and the roadmap on that. And we can see the screen, Kristen. And let's double check the audio. Hello. Yes, we have audio as well. Take it away. Awesome. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen McLeod, a product manager in the Microsoft People Systems Group. And I'm super excited today to share with you some updates we have on user profile photos in Microsoft 365. So first, user profile photos are important. They're like ambassadors. They represent who we are and they influence how others perceive us. They appear in nearly all applications and they bring life to experiences. They're also making it easy to identify which account you're interacting through and in some places are pointer to where you can quickly access your account settings. Today, I'll first share some updates on work we have underway to fix the fundamentals of user profile photos. And then I'll talk about how user profile photos are set up in different environments to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Then I'd like to share some tips on how to change your profile photo, and we'll share a brief update on recent improvements that we've made in Microsoft Graph for the developers in the audience. Uh, and then I'll wrap up by giving some indications of where we're going next once we have these foundations in place. So the first key foundational piece that we're focusing on is to ensure a consistent user profile photo is used across Microsoft 365 products. And that's by consolidating cloud profile photos to one service. Um, we're now in a good deal uh, of the way there, which means that most Microsoft 365 products have already migrated to the consolidated photo service. Uh, so that includes the Office and Outlook products, Teams, uh, OneDrive, Forms, Windows and the Viva Suite, amongst others. Also, SharePoint is now in the process of migrating so the, to the cloud service, so we're getting very close to a one cloud profile photo to rule them all situation. The second foundational piece that we're working on is to ensure that updates are visible across all products within 24 hours. And this is already the case for most applications. Um, Teams applications, however, currently take up to 30 days for the changes to be visible. So there is active work underway to reduce this update time. Now, what I'd like to do is to spend a couple of minutes to 
give an overview of the user profile photo sources in different environments to understand what's going on under the hood. So the cloud setup has evolved over the past couple of years. Uh, we went from siloed Microsoft 365 products with user profile photos being called by different cloud services, with some examples outlined here in red that include Outlook REST API and Exchange web services that have different requirements and different handling. So when, for example, Outlook web application would update or show a user profile photo, it would be doing so via OWA. So in addition to the Exchange online services, photos could be uploaded to Entra ID or formerly known as Azure Active Directory, which would then sync on to Exchange Online. What we've done is to consolidate these to a single Microsoft 365 cloud service and data store. And we've been gradually moving all Microsoft 365 applications over to this new service, either directly or via Microsoft Graph, which is what I mentioned earlier as the consistency efforts. Then uh, on premise enterprise users, photos can be uploaded to Exchange on premise or Active Directory. And the Exchange on premise photos are resized, then synced to uh, Azure Active, to Active Directory. Uh, for enterprise users that have an on-premise and a cloud presence and that have these uh, synced through on-premise sync, uh, the Active Directory photo will be uh, synced over to Entra ID. Uh, in this case, the photo that will be seen on the cloud would be the latest updated. So that would be either from on-prem or from the cloud. Now, one important update to or important point to mention here is that there is a one way only sync from on premise to cloud, which means that cloud photo updates won't propagate back to on premise. Uh, and what this means is that there is a risk that the on premise photos can become outdated. And also, since on premise photos are often updated by the IT admin, um, you might not even be aware that this photo is there. So on that note, let me take a moment to mention how these on-premise Active Directory photos can be changed or deleted. So the easiest way is to contact your IT admin, who is probably the person that gave you your account details. So check with them first. If not, you can typically reach out to the technical support team in your company or human resources department. Alternatively, you can run Active Directory commandlets yourself but note that your computer must be connected to your on-premise server uh, for this command to be executable. Um, so in practice, the easiest option is to get in touch with your IT admin. Uh, updating photos on the cloud is easier. So you can typically go to the account manager within Microsoft 365 Experiences, which is typically on the top right-hand corner of the page as shown here on PowerPoint Online. Alternatively, if you're an enterprise user, you can update your photo on Entra ID. Or if you're an enterprise user and your company has a license for Delve, you can update your photo there. Also, for developers, Microsoft Graph can be used as well. Uh, before wrapping up, I'd like to share a quick update for the developers in the audience. Uh, we're happy to announce that we now support Delete on Microsoft Graph. So feel free to go ahead today and try this out for yourself on Microsoft Graph Explorer. Uh, to summarize the key highlights from this presentation, uh, first of all, we remained committed to ensuring a consistent and fresh photo uh, across experiences in Microsoft 365. And for on-premises synced and on-premise users, please reach out to your IT admin if you'd like to remove your on-premise photo. The immediate next steps will be focused on wrapping up this foundational work to bring on board the final Microsoft applications, um, also to finalize the migration with SharePoint and to complete the freshness work in Teams. And then once we have these foundations in place, we'll be working towards improving the editing experience to make it easier to update your profile photo. And then we'll start thinking towards how we can build richer profile photo experiences that enable self-expression and that create value. And, updating the profile photo regularly to personalize the user profile. 
With that, I'll close the session by inviting you to share any feedback, comments, uh, requests or questions you may have. Anywhere you give feedback within Microsoft 365 applications and channels, um, as long as you mention user profile photos, this feedback will reach us. So thank you all for your attention and we very much look forward to hearing back from you. Excellent, thank you, Kristen. Sorry for my interruption. We will, with the magic of editing, it never happened, right? So we'll take it away. No uh, awesome, awesome, really good. I, I love, by the way, the presentation styles on the slides. Really, really cool. Uh, and crisp new pictures, those are cool. Awesome. Um, now, we'll follow up on the questions in the chat. Uh, from a timing perspective, let's then move to the last demo of today, uh, who is Marcel um, around uh, Visual Studio Code and Power uh, using Visual Studio create Power Apps from existing APIs. There we go. Marcel, we can see the screen. Audio good. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep, all good, take it away. Fantastic. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Marcel Fajeda. I'm Senior Product Manager in the Power Apps Pro Developer Team. And today I will have a cool demo. I will show how you can create a Power App from your existing API. Okay, so I like to start defining Power Platform. So let me just get here right and let's move to the first slide. Okay, so Power Platform, it is a low code extensibility model for Azure, uh, which welcomes everyone, welcomes uh, business uh, users, low code developers, we call uh, citizen developers, but also professional developers that we also call code first developers traditional developers that use traditional programming language to create applications, okay? And a developer, they do more than just coding, they actually solve problems. And Power Platform can be a very efficient way uh, to address some business challenges. And this is what we will cover today. But the main point it is Power Platform is for everyone, including professional developers, okay? Uh, that's why we have Power Platform developer tools. And that's my team. So we build tools such as PAC CLI, which is the main way, is a command line interface, is the main way for you to interact with all the components of our platform. Uh, we also provide integrations with uh, Visual Studio, for example, Visual Studio Code, and also GitHub and Azure DevOps, allowing professional developers to use all the knowledge that they have about uh, CI, CD, test automation, and everything else to be more efficient and very uh, reliable, okay? So the scenario that we will cover today, a scenario where it makes sense to use Power Platform, it is digital modernization. So that's the scenario of our demo. Uh, we have a legacy inventor management system. So imagine the developer, they have an API to get data from SQL databases, um, to get information about how many items I have in each warehouse and how many items are available. Okay, uh, But this is a legacy system. I don't have any mobile capability. I cannot see in a phone. So the developer is using Power Platform to create a custom connector, which is a wrapper around the API to make all the data of the legacy system available in Power Apps, providing a better experience for the users. So a few technicians, for example, they can check how many items are available in each warehouse uh, on the go when they are on the field. So let's recap the first uh, demo that we have, we will not go over today, uh, is possible for you to create a custom connector within Visual Studio. And when you do that, a custom connector, as I mentioned, is a wrapper around uh, API, and it uses an open API specification for you to do that. That's a file that describes the API. And if you are using Visual Studio, Visual Studio will generate this file for you in the right version, making your API available. Uh, but if even if you don't have the source code, if you have a, a API that you have access and you have the Swagger or the open API definition of this API, you should be able to use in Power Platform as well. And this is what we will cover today. We basically we will cover what happens under the hood, how Power Platform generates and creates the custom connector. So let's do a quick recap about how you create that in the inner loop. This is the developer, uh, the API developer, and, and this is the uh, web API source code. Uh, he's using Visual Studio. And here you can see in the project, we are connected to Power Platform already. This API is published. Uh, here you have the endpoint. This is the public endpoint of the API. And here you can see it is connected to Power Platform. 
Okay. So what we will do is we will open a uh, Power Platform, the Power Apps uh, Maker portal, to see the custom connector there. So here we are in the dev environment, and you can see we have the Visual Studio custom connector here, and this is our API. Okay. Uh, so Visual Studio generated that for us, and we are also using a solution. You can see the solution called Invent on Hand. And here we have the custom connector. And let me show you the app that we created from this custom connector using our API. Okay, So this is a simple app. It will show all the list of the available items and in where these items are available. Here we have the list of the items, and here we have how many of these items are available in each one of these warehouses. Uh, so this item three, you get the point. Two screens up, and we manually created this okay, from Visual Studio. What we will do now is we will create a custom connector, but we will create from VS Code. And VS Code is the easiest way for you to get Power Platform CLI, our command line interface. Okay, Just go to the VS Code. You look for Power Platform Tools. Once you get installed, you will have our extension for VS Code and also our CLI, our command line interface. So let's go to the demo. So what we will do now is we will generate the custom connector from the API. Okay. Let's go. So let's first let me open uh, my environment so you can see how many connectors I have. I am in the dev environment, and you can see I have one custom connector. Open to API Visual Studio. Okay. So let's go back to the v to VS Code. Let me close this and let me open my extension. You will see I am already connected to dev environment. Uh, already added my credentials here, so I will open terminal and then I uh, have available PEC CLI. So if I type PEC, you will see you can interact with many components of uh, our platform. Today we will use connector to create, to list and create a custom connector. So we will use PEC connector list to see what connectors we have available in our environment. We are connected to that environment. Here you can see the Invent API Visual Studio connector. And now we will create a new one. So the first thing you have to do is to use pack connector in it. This will create a new file, an API properties file. This is a description of uh, per platform properties of the custom connector. We will use default here. Uh, we don't need to add anything as of now. So let's get the open API file. This is our API. I need the open API specification. Uh, so I will download this uh, spec file in my command line. So let me call inventapi.json. And this file describes my API. Okay. All right. I have it here. Now, before we can use in Power Platform, we need to change a few things on the on the Open API file. Let's open here. First, let's change the name. Let's call Invent API VS Code. So we will see uh, which connector has been created from VS Code. And we have to add two properties here. We have to add uh, host, and also we need to add the schema. We are in this scenario. Here we have the endpoint. I will copy and paste to do not do any mistakes. Uh, this is our host. This is our public endpoint, and we are using HTTPS. Okay, you could do that from the Maker portal as well using the UI, but I'm using my uh, my developer hat today, so I'm doing all in the code first manner. Okay, I will save the file, and now I will use pack connector create to create the custom connector. Uh, we, uh, if you are using PEC CLI and we are not sure which parameters to use, you can always put help in the end, so you will see all the parameters available for the commands. Uh, here, I will need two parameters. One, to specify the open API file, the definition file. And here, I will call the invent API.json. This is my open API file. And I also need the properties file that I generated before. So PF is the alias, and I will add the API properties file. And I want to create this custom connector in a solution. Always use solutions. I uh, will check 
the unique name of my solution, invent on hand. So I will type here invent on hand. And that should be enough for me to create the custom connector. And this is what Visual Studio does under the hood. Uh, I would like to point out that at this point, we support Open API version 2. So if you are using Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio will convert for you. If uh, you are not using Visual Studio, you have to manually convert to version 2 at this point. Okay. So now that we created, let's use pack connector list. And here you can see the custom connector has been created. All right, so let's have a look on the maker portal. I'll build refresh and the connector should be here. And here we have invent API VS code. That's the connector that we just created. Let's check if it is in the solution, invent on hand. And uh, yes, it is in the solution. So that's great. Now I want to show a good thing. Another thing that we can do it is using pack CLI. From the custom connector, we can generate a Canvas app. We can create a sample app so we can learn how to call our API. So we will use Pack Canvas Create. I'm using help so I can see uh, what parameters it has. So I will use here Pack Canvas Create the name of the file, MS app file. This is a file that will be generated in my local environment, which is the Canvas app. And I also have to specify the connector ID. And I have the connector ID from the pack connector list that I run before. I will copy and paste. And that should be enough to, for, to create a Canvas app for me. And do you remember uh, in the Visual Studio demo, we did that manually. Here we are doing automatically. And you can see the app has been created. Let's load the app in the Power Apps Studio. So I will open and I will select the file from my local environment. That's not the right folder. Let me change to connector and app from API. Here's my app. And another thing that I have to do it is I need to add the custom connector because this has been generated in my local environment. Now I'm in the server, so I will use the Invent API VS Code custom connector. This will create a connection, and now it should be good to go. So here I have a functional app created from my API. You can see it. Uh, we have uh, one button for each operation. We have the table with all the fields. This is all reading from the Open API file. Okay. Here I can also test the invent on hand operation. As you can see, it works. Other one, and that's great. That's a great way for you to get started if you want to see how to call the custom connector. Not too familiar with PowerFX, for example. I can just uh, have a look here on the screens, uh, check the code in the buttons and how I am calling the API. So for example, let's see here the get. Here we have all the code, uh, how I'm calling the custom connector, where I am storing. Uh, so you get the point, right? It's a lot easier than starting from scratch. Um, and that's the demo that I have today. The point it is we have uh, PEC CLI, uh, which is the engine for all the integrations that we do. And uh, you can automate, you have lots of power with that. Okay. And the point made here is that Power Platform is for pro developers as well. Pro developers will feel very natural when using command line interface. And the custom connector, the connector command is in preview. Please. Uh, give us feedback. Uh, if you have any feedback, please test. Here I have the link for a GitHub repo with all the code used in this demo. There are information there about how you can get a developer plan and create a power platform environment for free. And also information about how you can create custom connectors. Could be from the inner loop when you are in Visual Studio, or could be in the outer loop as well. If you are using another API, as long as you have the open API file or you have the swagger, uh, you can create a custom connector from it. Okay. Uh, please 
get in touch. You can uh, use this GitHub repo, or you can get in touch with us as well. We are very active in GitHub, uh, in our GitHub page. Thank you very much. Back to you, Visa. Excellent. Thank you, Marcel. Really, really cool demo um, and really simplifies the, the creation of those apps. So awesome, awesome, awesome work by the team in there. Great, great, great. Now, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, a really awesome demos today. Next week on 26th of uh, September, uh, we have again three demos. So Dan Walling continues the, the series related on AI and Microsoft 365 extensibility. That's a really cool stuff. Uh, and thank you, Dan, for that demo already today. Then we have David Rousseau uh, showing us on how to build a dynamic 3D world in a collaborative way using Microsoft Teams AI and the metaverse capabilities, which are in Microsoft Teams. That's really, really awesome stuff. You might have seen some teasers around that one actually already in the social media a while back, uh, or maybe in a video in, in one of the YouTube channels. But David is going to go more detailed on what how it's actually being built and how it works within next week. And then we have Tishore uh, Sudeb. D, talking about develop and contribute to Power Automate designers. So how can we do those things in the Power Platform side? Uh, so this is the agenda for 26th of September. We'll publish that also in the meetup within upcoming days. Now, if you have questions, feedback, comments, or if you're building something and you need help, uh, please join also on our Discord channel. Relatively new thing, but we have already bypassed more than 500 attendees or registered uh, uh, at members within the Discord server as well. So you can go there, ask questions from other people within the community, create option uh, to find similar minded people who are building experiences within the Microsoft Cloud. So take advantage of that. Now, as part of this course, we would love to get your feedback as well. Uh, so it's super, super important for our management chain also to understand what do you think about the course? Are this valuable for you? Uh, and in general, if you have good suggestions on improvements or adjustments, please, please, please take advantage and give us feedback related on the form. Uh, so um, definitely welcome on adjusting our uh, execution based on the input from your side. As said, when we started, the recording will be available within 24 hours at the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Community YouTube channel. Subscribe there. You'll know immediately when it's actually getting published. Uh, typically, it's like 12 to 18, uh, 18 hours, uh, so it's not the full 24 hours, um, but depending on a week, that might actually happen. Follow us also on Twitter, and that's one way of actually catching up on what's actually happening. And as said, the next uh, community call with Microsoft speakers is on September 26th. This week, we also have have Power Platform monthly community call happening tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And then we have our Thursday series happening every single Thursday, 7 a.m. Pacific time uh, with community demos. And this week, that's Viva Connection and SharePoint Framework. You can see all of the available community calls from AKMS forward slash community and forward slash calls. And that's it for today. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a great rest of the week. Hopefully, we will see you in the, in the other calls to this week. If not, catch the recordings. And we'll see you next time on the Tuesday calls. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.